Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to another episode of our knowledge series. Over the last two weeks, every day we have been conducting live sessions at 10 a.m. in the morning and 3 p.m. in the afternoon. The aim of knowledge series is to help you cover 100 important static topics. The idea is to cover various important topics from across subjects so that you can easily prepare for the upcoming mains and as well as to help those aspirants who are preparing for next year, that is for prelims and mains of 2023. So if you're benefiting from this initiative, you know what to do. Please press the like button, share these videos with your fellow aspirants and don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And also, there is a separate playlist on our channel. There is a master playlist that has been created where all the knowledge series videos are available. So if you want to revise, you want to go back and watch those videos again, please make use of the playlist and the link has been provided in the comments and description below. So let's start with today's session of knowledge series. Today, the subject we are taking up in this session is international relations. And we are going to talk about an important grouping an important international organization known as FATF or the Financial Action Task Force. So let's understand everything about FATF. Let's see what is FATF, what is its role, why is it significant, so that you're in a good position to answer any question that might come either in prelims or in mains. Like I said, FATF stands for Financial Action Task Force. It is essentially an intergovernmental body it's an intergovernmental body that has been set up to deal with money laundering and terrorist financing. Please make a note of this. The two primary objectives of FATF is to counter or combat the menace of money laundering and as well as to counter financing of terrorism. Please understand that money laundering and terrorist financing, they are closely linked with each other. Terror financing is usually done through money laundering channels. And those of you who don't know what is money laundering, money laundering is nothing but a process through which illegal wealth is converted into legal wealth. That would be a very simplistic definition of money laundering. Essentially, the black money or illegally acquired wealth, it is cleaned of its dirt, it is cleaned of its illegal sources, and it is turned into legal wealth or into clean money. So this process, of cleaning dirty money or laundering dirty money is referred to as money laundering. Money laundering makes use of various channels, including Havala networks or Havala transactions. And these Havala networks, they are closely linked with organized criminal groups and as well as with terrorist outfits. Havala transactions or Havala networks, they are a type of informal way of transferring money from one place to another. Havala transactions, they work entirely on the basis of trust. It operates largely on the on the word to word mouth and it, it basically works on the basis of trust and money is moved from one place to another without physically actually moving the money, without leaving any trace behind or without recording any transactions in, 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 any, in any records or in a, any evidence book. So Havala transactions, they offer a convenient route for criminals and terrorists to move money around from one jurisdiction to another. It helps them evade the investigating authorities, the banking system, the financial system, right? They escape government surveillance and move money through these informal routes. And money laundering relies upon that. So money laundering process employs Havala transactions. And since it is closely linked with organized criminal groups and terrorists, there exists a direct link between money laundering and terror financing. So to combat these threats, these economic and security threats. There is an intergovernmental body known as FATF, the Financial Action Task Force. This organization was set up in 1989 by the G7 countries. The G7 is a group of industrialized nations, the Western industrialized nations. It includes countries like US, Canada, UK, France, and the others. So these group of countries, that is the G7, they established FATF in 1989. And when the organization was set up, it had only one objective, which was to combat money laundering. When the organization was set up, its only objective was to fight against money laundering. But later in 2001, after the 9-11 attacks happened in the United States, the FATF was given a second objective. 
and this was to counter terrorist financing. Because the 9-11 attacks carried out by Al-Qaeda, it involved aspects of money laundering. The terrorists of Al-Qaeda who executed the 9-11 attacks in the United States, they had received funds and finances through money laundering channels such as Hawala networks, Hawala transactions. So this clearly established the link between money laundering and terror financing. So following the 9-11 attacks, the FATF's mandate was updated. It was given a second objective, which was to target terrorist financing as well. Then later in 2012, the FATF's mandate has been further expanded to counter the financing of proliferation of WMDs or weapons of mass destruction. If any money is being used through the laundering channels to proliferate WMDs or weapons of mass destruction, like let's say chemical weapons, biological weapons or nuclear weapons. So the financing of such weapons program will also be tackled and curbed by the FATF. So these are the primary objectives of this organization. And another important fact you should be aware of regarding FATF is that its secretariat its secretariat is located at the headquarters of OECD in Paris. OECD is an economic organization based out of Paris. It focuses mainly on the European economy. So at the OECD headquarters itself, the FATF has its secretariat located. Now, who are the members of this intergovernmental body? That's another important fact that you need. This could be a potential prelims question. See, FATF is made up of 39 members. Please make a note of this. There are 39 members which includes 37 member jurisdictions or 37 countries along with two regional organizations. The list of countries, basically the list of members of FATF has been provided over here in this infographic. If you take a look, all the 37 countries which are members of FATF, they have been listed. These FATF jurisdictions includes United States, United Kingdom, you also have countries like Sweden, Russia, of course, India is also a member of FATF. Then we also have countries like South Korea, Japan, France, Germany, even China, and few Latin American countries and Australia, they are all members of FATF. Apart from these 37 countries or 37 member jurisdictions, there are also two regional organizations or regional groupings which hold membership status at FATF. This is a very, very important point for your prelims. UPSC could ask, which are the two regional organizations which have membership at FATF? The answer is the Gulf Cooperation Council, that is the GCC, and as well as the European Commission, which is one of the principal organs of the European Union. So European Commission of the European Union, it has membership at FATF along with GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, that brings together the Gulf countries, the West Asian countries like Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Oman, Kuwait, all these countries are members of GCC. So these two regional groupings also hold membership along with the 37 countries that are listed over here. And countries like Indonesia, they have the observer status. So as far as possible, be familiar with some of the member countries, especially the major countries which are members of FATF. This could be a potential area where UPSC could ask a very factual prelims question. Now, until then, whatever we discussed, until now, whatever we had covered, it, is, it was all a factual discussion. We just covered a few basic facts about FATF. But that is not where we should stop our understanding of FATF. We need to go a little beyond that. We need to understand what does the FATF do? What is its exact role? How does it counter money laundering? How does it counter terrorist financing? And why is this issue so important? See, the FATF, it comes out with a set of international standards. It comes out with a set of international regulatory standards, which has to be followed by all the jurisdictions. These standards of FATF, it will apply not just on the member countries, but it will apply in 200 jurisdictions around the world. So even if a country is not a member of FATF, even they will be bound to follow the FATF standards. So to ensure that FATF standards are followed by every country and they are enforced in these 200 jurisdictions around the world, 
there are regional FATF styled bodies that have been set up. There are a total of nine FATF styled regional bodies which have been represented in this map over here. There are nine FATF styled regional bodies which enforce the FATF standards. They, fre they frequently conduct the review of, th of those countries in the region to check whether they are implementing the FATF standards. So these FATF styled regional bodies, they assist the main organization that is FATF to counter money laundering and terror financing. They assist in enforcing these basic standards and ensure that the member countries and all the 200 jurisdictions are cooperating and they are on the same page when it comes to countering money laundering and terror financing. India on its part, it is part of the APG group, the Asia Pacific group, right? India also falls under the jurisdiction of the Eurasian group as well. So India is complying with FATF standards. It is accountable to the FATF style regional bodies and these nine regional bodies of FATF they work with the main organization, the FATF, and they play a key role in countering money laundering. Now let's talk about the exact functions of FATF. How does FATF counter money laundering? What is it that FATF is doing in ensuring that steps are taken against money laundering and terror financing? See, please remember that FATF is basically a policy making body. It's nothing but a policy making body. It comes out with these international standards that we were talking about. It comes out with few regulatory frameworks through which the gaps in the financial system can be fixed. If there are these gaps in the financial system, if suspicious transactions are not tracked, if they are not investigated, that is when money laundering will be enabled. That is when it's easy for the money launderers the criminals and the terrorists to move around money illegally through the laundering channels like Hawala networks. So it's very essential to have a standardized financial and banking system so that any suspicious transaction is tracked. A red flag is raised if there is a suspicious trans transaction and they have to be followed up. They have to be thoroughly investigated. So for this, you need an entire framework. You need a set of guidelines and standards and that is what the FATF does. The FATF acts like a policy making body and comes out with these international standards and regulatory frameworks. Now, the members of FATF along with the 200 jurisdictions where these standards will apply, they all have to comply by these standards and they have to inculcate these standards into their national laws. That is what FATF does. The FATF pushes all the countries to ensure that they include these standards recommended by the body into their national legal framework. So countries, they have to enact a law, enact a legislative uh, framework through which these FATF standards are incorporated. They have to enforce these standards as well so that every country is on the same page when it comes to anti-money laundering measures or AML measures and CTF measures or counter-terrorist financing measures. So this is the primary function of FATF. It functions like a policy making body comes out with international standards and regulatory frameworks and the member jurisdictions, right? All the jurisdictions where it applies, they have to inculcate those standards into their national laws. They have to enforce them as prescribed by FATF. Along with that, the FATF provides periodic recommendations. Every now and then, whenever there are new threats coming up, whenever new ways of money laundering come up, whenever new channels of terror financing open up, at every instance, FATF will come out with a set of new recommendations. It keeps updating the protocols. So the idea of FATF is to help the countries to plug any gaps in their financial and banking system to ensure that there is constant surveillance on the back end of the banking and financial system. To ensure that the member countries and the jurisdictions, they follow the standards, FATF has been given the powers to conduct a review of the performance of these countries. FATF has the powers to conduct periodic reviews known as mutual evaluations. So the member states of FATF, the 39 member jurisdictions, along with the 200 member jurisdictions, they're all responsible, they're accountable to FATF and through FATF style regional bodies, 
the FATF ensures that a periodic evaluation or a review is conducted of those countries to check whether they are following the standards and guidelines. This is what makes FATF really, really powerful. It's not just an advisory body. It's not just a policy making body. It is not just giving out recommendations and advisories. It can enforce them. It can act upon them and check whether the countries and member jurisdictions are following them, whether they are implementing these standards. So periodically, the FATF conducts a mutual evaluation, basically a review based on which countries are given a new set of standards and recommendations. Let's say a country is not matching up to FATF standards. Let's say the, in, in that country, there is still money laundering taking place. Let's say there aren't enough measures to tackle terror financing in a particular country. Then FATF will provide a action plan. The FATF and the, its regional uh, style bodies, they will provide suggestions. They will give an action plan which that country has to implement within a given deadline. A time bound action plan is given and the member countries and the other jurisdictions, they will be responsible to implement these action plans within the given deadline. So this is how FATF constantly ensures that countries are stepping up their vigilance against money laundering and terror financing. It not just gives out recommendations once a year or once in five years or once in 10 years. It's a constant process. It's a dynamic process. So every now and then it comes out with guidelines and recommendatory standards, which countries have to inculcate into their laws, into their legal frameworks. They have to enforce them and the performance of the countries, it is reviewed through mutual evaluations. So those countries which are falling short, they will have to accept the time bound action plan, which will be given by FATF and they'll have to work towards achieving the action plan that has been given by the intergovernmental body. So these recommendations of FATF basically creates an obligation on the member countries and on the 200 jurisdictions which fall under the purview of FATF. What kind of obligations are we talking of? See the member countries and the 200 jurisdictions, they have to follow all relevant international conventions related to countering terrorism, money laundering and organized crime. All the countries, the UN member states, essentially, they are bound, they are bound by international law to ensure that they uphold their commitments to all relevant international conventions. There are conventions related to money laundering, conventions related to various forms of organized crime. There are various UN resolutions related to terrorism, that is counter terrorism. So all these international resolutions and conventions will have to be followed and upheld by the countries and FATF will keep a check on that. Along with this, the FATF has recommended that every country has to introduce an anti-money laundering law. An anti-money laundering law has to be introduced, a dedicated law has to be enacted. And through this law, money laundering should be declared as a criminal offense. Money laundering should be criminalized and the concerned authorities, especially the enforcement directorate or directorate of enforcement, which deals with money laundering, they should be given the powers to confiscate the proceeds of money laundering. Whatever proceeds are accrued through money laundering channels, whatever assets are procured through money laundering, right? Whatever wealth or income or profits are generated through money laundering, they should all be confiscated by the authorities and they should have the powers to attach these properties to the ongoing case. Essentially, the proceeds of money laundering will be confiscated by the authorities and it shall be attached to the ongoing case. So this is a mandatory provision. Countries have to bring out a dedicated law for money laundering and declare money laundering as a crime, as a criminal offense. And they have to empower their enforcement directorate to have the powers to confiscate the proceeds and ensure that these proceeds are attached to the ongoing money laundering cases. Then, the countries have to strengthen the vigilance in their banking and financial system. They have to carry out due diligence and implement basic KYC norms. That is know your customer norms. The banks, the financial institutions, non-banking non -financial, non uh, financial institutions or NBFCs, right? Any institution basically which provides banking and financial facilities and services. 
they will all be bound by these FATF regulatory standards and guidelines. They will have to maintain their records in a certain way as prescribed by FATF. They will have to create a system on the back end to watch out for any high value transaction and any suspicious transaction that might be taking place. If there is a suspicious transaction, a red flag has to be raised and immediately the transaction has to be investigated. So all these mechanisms will have to be created and this is an obligation of the countries. They have to ensure that due diligence is followed in the banking system and the financial system so that any route, any avenue available for money laundering and terror financing is curbed immediately. This is where FATF standards can be very, very effective because it helps in ensuring due diligence in the banking and financial system through basic KYC process, know your customer process. It helps in creating a back-end system where suspicious transactions can be detected, reported and investigated. And along with that, countries are obligated to set up a financial intelligence unit, a FIU. See, Enforcement Directorate or ED, it is a law enforcement agency. It is responsible for investigating the cases. It is responsible for collecting the evidence and taking the case for prosecution. So it is a law enforcement agency. But FATF states that there should be a separate intelligence agency for money laundering and related offenses known as FIU or Financial Intelligence Unit. For example, in India as well, we have set up a Financial Intelligence Unit, FIU India. Right? So these are the two primary organizations that have to be set up in a country. There should be a Directorate of Enforcement or ED, which will act as a law enforcement agency there should be an intelligence agency known as FIU, Financial Intelligence Unit, which will keep track of any suspicious activity in the banking and financial system. Along with this, all UN members, FATF members and all the jurisdictions that we saw earlier, they are bound to cooperate with each other. They have to extend international cooperation when these cases are being investigated and prosecuted. Because money laundering and terror financing, they are not limited to a particular jurisdiction. Usually these are transnational crimes, these are transboundary crimes and hence international cooperation is absolutely essential. So FATF has the powers to frequently review the performance of the countries through the mutual evaluation process. It can check whether the countries and jurisdictions are following these standards and following a thorough review and thorough assessment, it can check whether these countries are implementing these standards and enforcing these standards. So a regular follow-up, a regular periodic review is done by FATF. Those countries which are falling behind, they are first given an action plan, a time-bound action plan which has to be implemented in a, within a given deadline. But if a country is deliberately failing, if it is not showing any seriousness to improve its performance, then FATF will acquire punitive powers. It can actually take action against countries. That is why FATF is a powerful organization. It has been given the required authority to take serious punitive action against countries which are not cooperating, which are deliberately helping or enabling money laundering and terror financing. So these countries or these jurisdictions, they can be listed on the grey list and black list of FATF. Now, this is something you would have frequently read in newspapers. I am sure many of you would have read that Pakistan has been placed on the grey list of FATF. Right? There are a couple of countries which are on the black list of FATF. So, these topics are frequently in news. So, what do you mean by this grey list and black list? So, let's understand a little more about this. This represents the punitive powers of FATF through which it can punish the jurisdictions and countries which are not following the standards, which are deliberately violating uh, these international standards. So FATF has the power to declare a country as non-cooperative country. If a country is not cooperating at all, if it is deliberately encouraging money laundering and terror financing, FATF can declare that country as a non-cooperative jurisdiction. It can formally call for action against that country. This is informally referred to as the black list of FATF. See, formally, FATF doesn't use the term blacklist or greylist. This is generally used by the media. The formal names for blacklist is call for action or non-cooperative 
jurisdiction. Grey list is formally referred to as other monitored jurisdictions which are brought under enhanced monitoring and surveillance. So if a country is deliberately violating the standards, FATF will first issue a warning. It will issue a notice by placing that country on the grey list. Let's say a country is falling behind the standards. Initially, FATF would have given an action plan. If it still doesn't implement the action plan within a deadline, if it is deliberately failing again and again, and if terror financing, money laundering are, are easily being carried out in that country, then FATF might grey, grey list that country. This is the first punitive action that is taken. So once a country is grey listed, the particular country will come under enhanced monitoring, enhanced surveillance of the FATF. Again, another round of action plan is given, specific actions are listed out by FATF which that country has to execute. Is that clear? And a specific deadline is also, is also mentioned by the FATF. Even after this warning, even after placing this country on the grey list, if it is still not showing any progress, any improvement, if it is still violating the FATF standards, then finally FATF can take maximum action by declaring it as a non-cooperative jurisdiction, meaning the country will get blacklisted. It essentially means that these countries are deliberately not following the standards. It means that these countries are encouraging money laundering and terrorist financing. They are not interested in curbing these threats. So such countries can be blacklisted by the FATF. So those countries which don't comply with these standards, they actually invite strict punitive action from the FATF. As of today, there are 23 countries, 23 jurisdictions, which have been placed on the grey list of FATF. It includes countries like Turkey, Myanmar, Syria, Yemen, of course Pakistan, even United Arab Emirates, tax havens like Cayman Islands, all these countries you see over here, the list of 2023 20, countries you are seeing over here, they are all on the grey list of FATF. Recently, Zimbabwe was removed from the grey list because it showed progress. Please remember this point. It could be important for your prelims. Zimbabwe showed some improvement in the, in the recent uh, last few months and as a result, FATF has removed Zimbabwe from the grey list. So once a country is on the grey list, FATF will give out a new action plan Specific points will be listed out that these are the measures you have to take to improve your performance and a deadline is also given. If this grey listed country shows any progress, if it shows any improvement, then following another review, the country might be removed from the grey list, like Zimbabwe was removed recently, right? But if it is still not cooperating, if it is making very slow progress, then FATF might retain the country on the grey list itself. And in the worst case, if the country is deliberately encouraging money laundering and terror financing, if it is deliberately not cooperating, then that country can be blacklisted. As of today, only two countries have been blacklisted by FATF. They have been declared as non-cooperative jurisdictions. And this includes Iran and DPRK, the Democratic Republic of Korea, which is nothing but North Korea. Please note down these points as well. Iran and North Korea, these are the only two countries which have been blacklisted. Now, of course, the obvious question in your mind is, sir, what will happen if a country is grey listed or blacklisted? The consequences can actually be very, very serious. See, when a country is grey listed, it means that the country might come under economic sanctions. The country runs the risk of getting elevated to the blacklist. And once a country is blacklisted, it will invite global economic sanctions against, against that country. The international lenders, global financial institutions like World Bank, IMF, Asian Development Bank, they will stop all their interaction with that particular country. They will stop providing loans. So a country which is blacklisted will find it impossible, almost impossible to raise loans and external borrowings from global financial institutions and from other countries and even from other lenders. It will find it difficult to raise capital. It will find it very, very difficult and almost impossible to get new loans and external borrowings in order to continue its, its economy, in order to continue running its economy. It will result in an immediate reduction in international trade. It will take a direct hit on imports and exports because this will result in economic sanctions against the country and, and it will affect the international trade of that country. Imports and exports will be hit and 
this will be a devastating blow to the economy of that country. Along with this, it will lead to an international boycott. Not just the international financial institutions, but even other countries which might be providing aid or loans, etc. They will stop providing that assistance. They won't be able to provide that because they are oblig obliged by FATF standards to ensure that these sanctions are implemented strictly and enforced strictly. So, the international boycott and the reduction in its ability to raise capital and to procure loans will result in a downgrading of its credit rating. The sovereign credit rating of the country will be downgraded by the credit rating agencies. This will directly hit capital inflows into the country, that is the inflow of FDI and FII. No investor is going to invest in that country. There will be no foreign direct investment. Nobody will invest in the capital markets of that country, in the stock markets of that country. So the economic consequences can be very, very serious if a country gets blacklisted. Even if a country is grey listed, there are serious consequences. Because it shows that the country is on the way to getting blacklisted. It will reduce the inflow of capital. It will make it difficult for the country to get loans and capital from other countries and from other foreign sources. Now this is where the topic becomes very important to us because Pakistan has been on the grey list of FATF for many years. After the Mumbai attacks, after the 2611 Mumbai attacks, India and US, they jointly put pressure on FATF, they used their influence and ensured that Pakistan was placed on FATF's grey list because Pakistan was not serious about combating terrorist financing. It was enabling money laundering and it had become a state sponsor of terrorism. So from 2008 to 2009, for almost one year, Pakistan was on the grey list for the first time. It showed some progress and as a result, it had been taken off the grey list. It had been removed from the grey list. But again in 2012, Pakistan was not showing any improvement. It was enabling terror financing and money laundering. So this time again, India, US and other countries, they used FATF platform to target Pakistan. So this time for three years, Pakistan was on the grey list from 2012 to 2015. It had showed some progress again and FATF had removed Pakistan from the grey list. This was the second time that Pakistan was on the grey list. And now recently, it has been placed again on the grey list for the third time since 2018. From 2018 till now, from 2018 to 2022, Pakistan has been on the grey list for the last four years. Because, again the same reason, Pakistan has not shown any seriousness to follow the FATF standards. It has not shown a serious commitment to target the terror groups and the terror financing that's happening in the country. This is where the problem lies for Pakistan and India has actually used FATF as a platform to exert economic pressure on Pakistan. This is India's way of fighting back against Pakistan's sponsorship of terrorism. See, the biggest problem with Pakistan is that it does not implement the FATF standards and it even doesn't follow UN resolutions related to terrorism. We have UN resolution such as resolution number 2462. This resolution mandates every UN member to criminalize terrorist financing. Pakistan has failed to do that. There is another UN resolution called the 1267 resolution. Under this, the 1267 sanctions committee has been set up. Also called the Taliban sanctions committee or the Al-Qaeda sanctions committee. So this sanctions committee of the UN Security Council, it has the powers to designate global terrorists. And once an individual is designated as a global terrorist, every country is obligated to freeze the funds and assets, financial assets of that individual. Every country has to deny access to weapons to these UN designated terrorists. And every country has to enforce a travel ban on these UN designated terrorists. The countries have to move ahead to arrest those individuals and prosecute them for terror related offenses. These are mandatory international obligations. But Pakistan has been repeatedly failing at this. Terrorist leaders like Masood Azhar, the founder and leader of jaish e mohammed Then terrorist leaders like Hafiz Saeed, the leader of lashkar e taiba and jamat ud -Dawa. Right? These are UN designated terrorists who have carried out major acts of terrorism against India and even against western targets. But Pakistan allows them to roam freely in the country and even if they are arrested, they are arrested for minor offenses like breach of peace. They are arrested under Maintenance of Public Order Act for disturbing public order, but they have never been charged 
for terror activities and terrorism under the Anti-Terrorism Act of the country. This is where the problem lies with Pakistan. It hasn't implemented the standards, it hasn't established the mechanisms needed to combat money laundering and moreover, it has enabled terrorist financing. It has become a state sponsor of terrorism. The biggest concern is that UN designated terrorists are roaming freely. They, even if they are arrested, they are not charged with terror related offenses. They are charged with minor cases and this is the concern about Pakistan. That is why Pakistan was placed again on the grey list and FATF gave Pakistan an action plan. It gave an action plan with 27 action points and over the last four years Pakistan implemented 26 of them. Basically Pakistan showed some progress over the last four years and later FATF reviewed the performance of Pakistan. It was not entirely satisfied so it didn't remove it from the grey list at the same time it didn't push Pakistan onto the blacklist. So even today Pakistan remains on the grey list. Another action plan was given with 34 action points. Pakistan has implemented most of them except for one which is investigating and prosecuting UN designated terrorists. This is one action where Pakistan is failing. It has to investigate and prosecute terror leaders, UN designated terror leaders like Hafiz Saeed and Masood Azhar. For this reason Pakistan continues to remain on the grey list and just two days back FATF held a plenary meeting at Berlin. Periodically FATF meets along with the regional bodies and reviews the performance of all the jurisdictions. During the latest review which happened just a few days back in, in this week, Pakistan's performance was reviewed and FATF has said Pakistan has shown considerable improvement. It has shown considerable progress and it is almost at the verge of exiting the grey list. If everything goes well for Pakistan, it might exit the grey list very soon. But as of now, as of today, it continues to remain in the grey list and FATF is going to carry out an on-site inspection. It will conduct a final on-site inspection to check whether Pakistan has really implemented and enforced these standards. If Pakistan acts against these terrorists, if it arrests them, investigates and prosecutes them, then definitely Pakistan might be removed from the grey list. This is where India is putting up pressure against Pakistan at the FATF. India knows Pakistan is not serious about its actions. It never targets terrorism genuinely. It continues to sponsor terror against India. So India continues its course of diplomacy and we are using FATF as a platform to target Pakistan and impose an economic cost on Pakistan. India has made attempts to use its influence to get Pakistan blacklisted. But Pakistan gets the support of other countries like Malaysia, Turkey, Iran and many other countries and as a result it has been able to avoid the blacklist. But it has not been removed from the grey list as well, it continues to remain in the grey list but for India it has become an important tool to punish and target Pakistan. So from India's point of view you need to note that India has been a member of this group of this intergovernmental body from 2010 and we are part of the Asia Pacific group and the Eurasian group like I mentioned earlier. Right? India is part of these FATF style regional bodies and we strictly abide by FATF standards. India has a very strong commitment to international law and we have implemented all the FATF standards through the Prevention of Money Laundering Act that was enacted in 2002. The PMLA, this is what gives authority to the Enforcement Directorate. This is what declares money laundering as a criminal offence in India and allows ED to confiscate the proceeds and attach the proceeds of money laundering to the ongoing case. So through PMLA we have enforced FATF standards and through Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, India has implemented FATF standards to counter terror financing. These are the two primary legislations through which India is implementing FATF standards. Is that clear? We are implementing money laundering standards through PMLA terror financing standards through Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. But the reason why FATF is really significant for us is because it is helping India to counter terrorist financing. It is helping us to counter the state sponsorship of terrorism by states like Pakistan. So that is why the grouping is very important, it's frequently in news and this is where I would like to conclude my discussion. With this we have covered all the important facts about FATF which are needed for prelims. We have analyzed the significance of the grouping, the functions and the objectives 
and why Pakistan is on the grey list and why is FATF important for India. This critical analysis that we have carried out will be very very useful for you in your mains exam. You can definitely expect a question either in international relations or maybe even in internal security. There could even be an essay topic on money laundering and terror financing. So it's a very important topic. Please pay attention to it. Note down the key points that we have listed and I'm sure with this discussion you'll be able to answer any question that is going to come. So now let's look at a few questions before we end the session. Gunjan Karbanda is asking, does it also keep check on money laundering through cryptocurrency? Definitely yes. Cryptocurrency has become a route through which money laundering can be easily carried out. So definitely FATF is working to establish mechanisms through which money laundering can be checked in the crypto world as well. Next, how is membership given to a country in FATF? What is benefit of being a member of FATF? See, to be a member of any intergovernmental body or any international organization, you have to submit a formal application. So, let's say if India, when India wanted to join FATF, India submitted a formal application based on certain basic eligibility criteria, India was admitted into the group, right? Basically, when you apply for membership, you have to show seriousness. You have to show a commitment to follow the standards, the rules that are being recommended. So once a country meets those eligibility criteria, it will be accepted as a member. And what is the benefit of being a member? By being a member, you can contribute to the policy making process. You can provide your suggestions, your recommendations to make the standards better, right? You can use the platform in a better way to target money laundering and terror financing. So there's a lot of benefit to, to be a member of FATF. Next, what will happen even after countries don't take action after being blacklisted for long? What if they're not responding even then? then economic sanctions are imposed on that country, right? If a country is not cooperating at all, right? And if it is blacklisted and if it is still continuing with the same behavior, the economic sanctions will continue. Now see what has happened with Iran and North Korea. They have been largely cut off from the global economy and their economies are collapsing, they're falling apart. Even Pakistan, which, whose economy is struggling, right? It has taken a very big hit after Pakistan was grey listed. Because even grey listing by FATF has an impact. It, it's not easy to get capital and loans to borrow loans from abroad when, when you're grey listed by FATF. So Pakistan is already feeling the impact of grey listing. Next, last question. What are few examples of action plan? See, in the action plan, FATF will identify the gaps that exist in the money laundering mechanism, anti-money laundering mechanism. Let's say banks are not keeping proper records. Or let's say there is no financial intelligence unit in that country. Or let's say the KYC process, which is followed by our banks and financial institutions, if it is not being followed properly. Let's say suspicious transactions are not being flagged, right? Those specific areas are identified during FATF's review. And FATF will suggest how you can plug that gap. What measure can you take, legal or administrative measure, what can be taken to plug those gaps? So those are given as action points and they have to be implemented within a given deadline. Next, last case, uh, last question. India never failed uh, in implementing the standards, but money laundering cases, there are a lot of money laundering cases in India. Yes, even after a country follows all the standards and implements them, even then money laundering cases will be there because that is the nature of this crime, right? In India, yes, money laundering cases have been quite a lot in the last 15, 20 years as we have integrated more with the global economy, but the government on its part has fully implemented the standards and we are enforcing them strictly as well. So I think with this, we can end today's discussion. We have covered all the given questions there. So I hope it was a fruitful discussion. Do let me know how it went in the comment section and do like the video and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.